when we uh, talk about Indo-Pak trade relations, there are certain uh, uh, truisms which are always repeated in vogue, maybe repeated ad nauseum. There is something called great warmth between the businessmen and civil society of the two countries. Another thing which is spoken of is the win-win situation. It's a truism. Another thing which I always hear is the a great trade potential between the two countries. And the estimates vary. Somebody says $60 billion. Some from 30 to 60 to, I have recently come across a study in which it is mentioned that the potential is 586 or 536 billion dollars. So you can imagine the variation. Another, another uh, 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 truism which I always have to give my ear to is that what is called political will and therefore the thrust forward. And of course, some of the mention of business dislocations, which will come about in case, as uh, uh, Professor Dube mentioned about free trade and removal of the, all the lists in the negative, negative lists or sensitive lists, as we call them. Then uh, uh, the other part of it is the problems, it's that there are uh, NTMs and PTMs of, of galore when uh, we talk of trade. Then there's lack of harmonization that's also <coughs> mentioned quite often. lack of standardization, onerous procedures. Some mentioned about uh, the ease of doing business between, these, between the countries is, uh, uh, if you have an index, it could be uh, in the index of 150, it will be 142 or 143, some, some such figures. They said about say, 26 signatures are required for uh, passing the good from one side to the other. 26 di different offices, and all that. <coughs> then there is also this uh, matter of connectivity. Lack of connectivity uh, 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 between, uh, uh, lack of infrastructure. <coughs> Professor Dubey mentioned about uh, development of infrastructure. He mentioned about joint. Some people mentioned about <coughs> several uh, development, separate development. So these things are always mentioned. And uh, in all uh, the gatherings which uh, are, are assembled to uh, deliberate on why the trade relations are not moving ahead, I have the occasion to hear these problems. <coughs> From the, uh, uh, I would like to, of course there are, pro these problems are there. And mm -hmm. I have somehow not seen much uh, thought or deliberation come upon the uh, community, the business community or the, or the uh, thinking community of why these problem, existent problems somehow cannot be resolved. And then very generalized terms of lack of political will, uh, the, the, the politics uh, of confrontation, a lot of generalizations. 
maybe we might now, the thinking community especially, come to the grips and say why, why not? If it were, if it were total lack of political will from all the uh, forums where the politicians, uh, where the political leadership gets together, there is, like if you analyze the uh, speeches of all the uh, political leaders at the uh, SARC summit in Kathmandu in November, all leaders, without exception, mentioned of the lack of trade, the lack of connectivity, the necessity of connectivity. If it were like that, it could not have been so unanimously and unexceptionally mentioned. So there could be some other problem. Maybe we have not been able to pin down those problems. <coughs> Maybe there are vested interests, very deeply entrenched, who even at the slightest movement rally around in a vanguard way and see that it is undone. Maybe some other problems. In this our context, Professor Dubé mentioned about uh, the unfazing of the negative sensitive lists. That is not the case. When SAFTA was agreed, there was a, a very determined, the TLP, what is called, Trade Liberalization Program, in phases. The first phase was over, and even Pakistan reduced the, the sensitive lists. Even the second phase is over now, so they have brought down the lists. Of course, India gave the, gave the lead, and it, it has removed all items from the sensitive list, not only for uh, uh, Bangladesh, but for all LDCs. And there are no, no elements in sensitive list, except some on tobacco, liquor, which are on health ground, but those are very insignificant. They, they don't contribute much to the trade. With Pakistan and Sri Lanka, there are items in the sensitive list which we want to bring down in a calibrated way. <coughs> the Sri Lankans have uh, had mentioned that it's difficult for them <coughs> because of revenue concerns and therefore they are, they will be slightly late. But the third phase has kicked in and hopefully during the next <coughs> Committee of Experts meeting, we will see some pruning of the lists. In addition, there is a lot of work going on under the SARC rubric. Of course, we see only the, uh, the, the, the negatives are naturally highlighted as in the case of any other uh, field of activity. <laughs> the negative of the, the railways agreement and the motor vehicles movement, the goods movement <laughs> agreement uh, was like bloated as if it's a total failure of the uh, summit in the media or elsewhere. But that is not what, what, what it was. It is that at a certain level, everything has been, had been agreed. And perhaps there were some issues with the country or two, which are not insurmountable and may be able to be circumscribed and passed over. In the SAR context, 
we have, all the countries have signed and ratified the agreement on trade in services, soft free trade in services. So it's a matter of time when we actually bring our lists to the table, agree, and then move ahead on that sphere. Professor mentioned about uh, investments. Our Prime Minister made a very, very uh, bold statement in the summit about, of course, lack of trade and then the circuitous route and how it is uh, 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 four times costlier to consumers than it could have been when if it were direct. Uh, several other things and what, he, what uh, we could do unilaterally, business uh, visas or health, all these things. But one thing he mentioned and it was not uh, uh, caught up is that there is a necessity of <coughs> correcting the skewed nature of trade between India and her neighbors. Because it is overwhelmingly in favor of India, which because of lack of other collateral sort of movements, finances or invisibles, is not sustainable. He mentioned that. And to correct that, because of course, trade is a function of your <coughs> Supply elasticity, how much is demanded and how much you could supply. And there are great uh, uh, problems of uh, supply inelasticity in the countries which have say, negative balance of trade. And therefore, to correct that, said, why don't you mobilize the uh, Indian investments so that you could produce in your own country, create jobs, and export to India? And to that extent, correct the imbalance, the extent imbalance. I don't know if this conference, this meeting, would be uh, uh, taking up that. Of course, it will be in the bilateral context, but I'm mentioning of the. Under the SAC rubric, again, not highlighted or mentioned are two specialized organizations called, it's very nicely <laughs> uh, one is named Sarso and one is named Sarko. One is the Arbitration Council, SARC Arbitration Council, another is SARC Standardization Organization. Both are functional, finding their feet and would be, would go some way in addressing a lot of issues. I suppose uh, I don't have to uh, blow up the a lot of work which is going on on the finance side, on eco trade. Of course, there is being a lot of mention, and, and over the uh, through the day there would be on the social side, health, agriculture, science and technology, all these. So a lot of things we'll see a fallout of all these uh, uh, activities <coughs> coalesce into a sort of critical mass which will push this <coughs> trade, which in itself is a very uh, like confidence building uh, uh, activity, trade. And trade, though as, uh, as of now is say, around 2 billion, could see a jump and, and these things, I don't know. The history of trade, uh, there are experts of uh, 
uh, who, who have studied trade in great detail and would know that it's incremental, it is sustaining over a long period of time. But I personally feel that there could, it could happen that someday you see a great uh, 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 propitious atmosphere climate and it would accelerate which people would not have imagined. I mean, it happened with us in uh, with India, China. Trade was what it was in the 70s, 80s and then now over 100 billion dollars. So it could happen just like that between India and Pakistan or within this, uh, the, in the SARC region. And therefore, we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wish to thank you for enlightening us about SARC, but let me tell you from my personal ex example. I was chairman of the SARC Finance, and we decided that there should be banking branches in each of the country. And we had two Sri Lanka, one Sri Lankan and two Bangladeshi bank branches in Pakistan. And after this resolution was passed by SAR Finance, both of them wound up their shops and went away. So that is the difference between the pronouncements and the actual action. So I think SARC has a lot to do, but there is a big gap between what they say and what they do. And uh, this gap is to be actually filled in. Thank you very much uh, for your intervention. The next speaker is Lieutenant General S. A. Hasnain, who is a visiting fellow at Vivekananda International Foundation. He was the GOC of Srinagar, Base 15 Corps from 2010 to 2012. General Hasnain. Thank you, sir. And chairperson. My fellow panelists, <clears throat> members of this very august audience, a special mention to Dr. Najum Sethi sitting right in front here, who I just happen to recognize. And we've been across the border many times discussing things on television. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here. Now, the only problem I find in a conference of this nature is that, except for the last one minute, there was not a smile on the face of a single individual here. And you may be just wondering, am I the joker in the pack? <laughs> the general of the Indian Army served in Kashmir, commanded the Kashmir Corps. What has Dr. Taneja done by pulling me here, trussing me up, tying me up? I was in Mumbai yesterday, and she forced me out from there. I said, no, you've got to come here. So I said, OK, I'll be here. And I got to be here for a different purpose. Since morning, you've been hearing statistics, figures, without a smile on your face. you got to do trade. You got to get into e economics. It's beyond figures. There are emotions, and there's a lot of common sense involved in this. And should a soldier be telling you, economists, <laughs> that? Let me tell you, besides the fact that I'm a core commander of in Srinagar and from the Indian Army, let me give you a slight, somewhat little background, my credentials otherwise. I happen to symbolize the finest thing between India and Pakistan. I have a joint family. I have a, come from a family which has got half or more than half the family in Pakistan. I come from a family which has given two core commanders, one in Pakistan and one in India, both in Kashmir. <laughs> Very rare thing. Right? And at one time, of course, that core commander, who's my first cousin, much senior to me, was across the line of control when I was a brigade commander. And there were times when we were shelling each other. So, so there's a lot of emotions, a lot of common sense this makes about getting together and doing business and doing economics, right? So having said that, let me try and outline to you a few aspects of common sense here. But it starts with perception. About uh, 12 years ago, when the srinagar Muzaffarabad bus service was about to commence, and I have Shudad Bukhari Sahib sitting here from Kashmir. He remembers that incident time very well. I was given the task of opening the Srinagar Muzaffarabad Road. I was the commander of the Uri Brigade at that time. And one of the first tasks was to have a flag meeting at a, a place called Kaman, where the Pakistan Army and the Indian Army were to sit together and discuss how the bridge would be made and how this road would get operationalized. And while I was thinking of this first meeting in many, many years between Indian Army and the Pakistan Army, 
what should I take as gifts for the Pakistan army? So I said, oh, what do Pakistanis love? So I started, started off. Maybe for every member of the delegation on the other side, a tin of pan bahar. Maybe a couple of good pan leaves, fresh pan leaves from Jammu. Veer Zara and Pakiza DVDs. <laughs> right, some good zafran from Kashmir, from Pampor. And a few uh, cases of paper mache. Good things. We put them all together and took it there and we gave it to our guests mm -hmm. there. And we, the, uh, we, took, we surprised the Pakistani delegation. Although Pakistan is always known to be better at hospitality than India ever. What they did was they brought a huge basket of sweets. They said, ye pindi ki mithai hai. I said, wonderful. And they said, actually you'll be surprised. The most amazing thing you may never have heard of it. It's called barfi. <laughs> now that's the lesson I want to bring out. The difference of perception in the modern, in the new generation today. I said, Barfi, you forgot. Punjab was one thing. Sindh Rajasthan, UP people are there. Culturally, we are one thing. Barfi, you come here and I'll give you a Barfi of Baramula. See, this is the perception. I'm introducing a different concept for you here. The whole concept of common sense. It makes a lot of sense. If a new generation, a generation is coming up today which doesn't understand this, then you will work through all this with figures and statistics. Right? And figures and statistics will not get you what ultimately emotions and common sense will get you. Right? I thought I must start with this. I've already taken up five minutes of mine, so I'll only spend three or four minutes more. But for me, it makes a lot of sense. Trade. My brother is a trader. He's an economist. So I was sitting with him in the morning. I said, no. He asked me, what the hell are you doing there? So I said, you should be coming along with me, actually. He said, no, no, let's discuss. So he said, why do nations trade? Neighbors, why do they trade? Why should Pakistan trade with Australia and with Latin America if it can have the same things from India? Much cheaper. Transportation, right next door, things can be much cheaper. Economic relations between, between nations obviously drive political relations. And of course, that's the best way to grow together. So obviously, economics drives security. Economics always drives security. But I must add here, the security also drives economics. The other way around also. So you cannot wish it away. Without security, without a security understanding, Without a political understanding, we may be talking in the air here. All these figures that have been quoted here and what you're looking at the future, etc., will be a pipe dream. If we don't get our we don't get our political and our security relationships in place. And that is something which I would like to emphasize upon. Many years ago, when I was a young major working in the military intelligence directorate, I remember Central Asian Republics were just opening up in 1992. And we said, my God, what an amazing opportunity, both for Pakistan and for India. So from 1992 to 2015, 23 years, where have we gone on the exploitation of that area? Because of the trust divide. Uh, India can do no business in Central Asia unless it gets its act together with Pakistan. Pakistan can do a lot of business there. But Pakistan can be the conduit and can be the beneficiary through transportation. But for all that happens in terms of trade and business between Central Asia and India, why should India have to approach Central Asia from Chabahar? <coughs> it must be approaching it through from uh, Amritsar, Vaga, and on to the Northwest Frontier province. That's what should be making sense. So I thought I must bring this up, power of electricity and, pa and power. I went to Tajikistan the other day. I was there. I found uh, a Pakistani delegation in, had, was already there, and they were, they were looking at uh, the aspects of import of power. Tajikistan has got huge uh, potential for hydroelectric sources, as you're aware. And there was a move going on on how to bring power directly from Rajasthan, uh, from, from Tajikistan into Swat. Makes a lot of sense. Just a, a small uh, a portion of the Wakhan corridor or somewhere, I think, in the middle there is, which uh, needs to be transgressed, and you have to just bring it in from there. Makes a lot of sense, right? And the same thing can actually be transported to India. It makes a lot of sense to bring it even up to India. 
all from India to transport it back to convey it back to, to Pakistan. So if we have our if we have our trust together, if we have got our security um, uh, relationship and uh, and and, and, and uh, perceptions correct, why should there be any problem in doing this kind of a thing? But uh, let's be real. Trust and security, two very, very important things which drive, ultimately drive uh, economic relationships between nations. And uh, uh, I think today it's a time when civil societies drive such relationships. Of course, uh, you will have political leaderships, you will have military relations, uh, uh, leaderships which will drive many things. But ultimately, it is civil society which drives it. And civil society doesn't work only on official terms. Civil society can actually pressurize tremendously, and this is the kind of initiative which can pressurize governments tremendously. But uh, a word of caution and a word of which something which uh, my guests may not like from Pakistan. But uh, 